is Rumble, and uh, this is Michael Moore. And thank you, uh, everyone, for listening today. My guest is uh, Dr. Abdul El Sayed, and uh, he ran the uh, Detroit Health Department uh, for a number of years uh, in Detroit, and, um, and then ran for governor. He was the Democratic nominee for uh, governor in, in uh, 2018, and um, he didn't make it, uh, but uh, he had a lot of uh, support from people like myself and, and uh, many Michiganders. Um, he uh, has taught, he's uh, been a professor at Columbia University, um, and uh, I'm honored that you're here. So thank you for coming and, and being part of this. And, and you know, we're just a few days into what seems like uh, life, has, life has changed uh, in terms of how the social order is being upended a bit here. Um, how, how's, it, how's it been for you? Yeah, that's right. I, first, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And thank you for covering this topic. Um, yeah, it's been a lot. I mean, I, I uh, in effect, I was, I, I, I'm on, on the go often and, and spent a lot of time in airplanes. And really, it feels like the rest of my life has just sort of been uh, put on indefinite hold. But, um, you know, I'm grateful to be able to hunker down with uh, my folks and, um, and hope that uh, I can help get the word about out about uh, what is a, a very serious disease and something that it's going to take all of society to tackle. And yeah, and, and I, and I think everybody gets that part of it. I think at least I think they do. Um, although we were, we were just out um, on the street and noticed the um, people in restaurants or whatever. And, and, and people being fairly casual about not worrying about how close they're you know, sitting with each other or, you know, uh, connecting with each other. And, um, so I'm, I'm a little torn between this understanding that everybody has a responsibility here to keep everybody else safe, including themselves. But, but if you listen or watch the TV for too long, you have this sense that we are all supposed to be, you know, figuring out uh, like, like we're, we're our own, we're our own department of public health directors, (laughs) as opposed to where is our government? Where, where is you know, ultimately, we're not going to be safe if we don't have something, someone in charge of this. Yeah, that's been the frustrating thing about all this is that you wonder where are the public officials? Um, you know, you can imagine uh, even under any administration, whether you agreed them with them or you didn't, um, there would have been a much more hands-on proactive approach to this. And unfortunately, under this president, uh, we've seen too little too late. He's deliberately misinformed the public. Um, and you feel like there is pressure that is being put upon um, the scientific and public health leadership not to uh, cross a particular set of lines. I will say, you know, I really admire folks like Anthony Fauci, um, who's been doing this for a very long time. Uh, but y- you you worry that the focus has largely been uh, yeah. on the politics rather than on the public health mm-hmm. and on the science. Um, but even with Dr. Fauci, it, you you see him, um, you see the struggle. You can actually watch the struggle on his face, where he is. He will. He does not want to not tell the truth. He does. He wants to be transparent, but he's choosing his words very carefully, so that he he doesn't um, upset the, um, you know, narcissist in chief. And yeah. um, I just worry. I worry that we're still not being told everything we need to be told, um, you know, what, what they're so afraid of, uh, of, uh, panicking people, um, because they're afraid of the market as in the stock market. I think it's starting to, to really come out. I I think early on, there was an effort by the administration to sort of tamp it down and undersell it. I think now, um, what, what is becoming obvious is the number of cases develop as we have it in, you know, 49 out of 50 States. Uh, the president himself had to get uh, get tested. Um, I think they realized that the only way around it is through it. And um, I think we saw some of that in the emergency declaration yesterday, although there's a lot uh, to be frustrated about there. You know, it's you, know, you have this troop of CEOs from various brands, um, and it, it almost feels like what Trump is telling us is that he trusts the, 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 the private market to get it right uh, more mm-hmm. than he trusts the administration yeah. that he's in charge of. And you know, See, even that, that press conference on Friday that you're referring to, um, he, 
stood within inches of everyone, um, uh, shook a number of their hands. They shook their hands back with him. Um, they were all touching the same microphone with their mouths, you know, an inch away um, uh, from the microphone. And right there, I just said, okay, this is, if they're doing, they're not serious about this. You know, wh why would they risk, why would they risk that? Why would these people are going to be on this task force? I know why Trump would risk it because he's an idiot as far as I'm concerned, but, but why would they risk it? These are the people that are supposed to be leading the, the, the effort to make sure everybody who needs to get tested gets tested. Yeah, that's right. I, I think the parallel here is, is really important to what happened in China at the beginning. Um, you know, you had an authoritarian culture that's, that's steeped inside and outside of uh, the Communist Party in China. And people weren't able to be fully transparent and report bad news because they thought it might piss off the people uh, above them on the pecking order. And yeah, the frustration that is like? that, <laughs> exactly, right? The frustration is that in our country, our system is supposed to be inured to that because we democratically elect our leaders and the person who's at the top of the hierarchy is literally accountable to all the rest of us. That's how it's supposed to work. But um, you can see that there's a certain level of fear uh, and there's a certain need to kiss up to uh, the president around this that creates a culture uh, where, um, and I'll tell you, in a public health crisis, you need full, open transparency that uh, respects the science and the facts and the statistics above all else. And no, matter how, no matter how bad the news is. Exactly, right? Because you have to be able to respond. And uh, that response sometimes is painful. It, it, it requires you to do things that, um, that you wouldn't necessarily do that have real consequences in society. I mean, like we're talking about right now, people shutting down schools, right? That means that kids have to stay home. They are, shut, they are parents, shut down, yeah. Exactly, that parents... Uh, are trying to figure out how to care for them, um, where you're talking about a, a whole of society response. And we already know what, what this is doing to the economy. I think we're thinking about it the wrong way. We're focused on the stock market. We should be focused on the people. But all that is to say that you need to be able to create a heuristic that these decisions are going to be made with respect to what the science tells us is proper intervention, rather than to what the narcissism and or uh, ego of the the person in charge uh, feels about what that may seem may mean for his uh, political future, and um, you know I, I still worry that we haven't quite uh, gotten there. Although I think we're getting a lot further, and I, I do appreciate the people working in challenging circumstances to to make sure to try and right the ship, um, even as they're working for a president who we all know um, just it d does not have what it takes uh, to to hold his office. How soon do we become Italy? When when does the lockdown happen? When when um and and should we already be there? Should we already be in some sort of self quarantine um, where we are not uh, going out at all? Forget about don't be in crowds of more than five hundred people or whatever. What um it seems just from what I've read that that once China figured it out and went into lockdown mode. Um, they immediately, that immediately arrested the spreading of the, of the virus. Um, are we, are we, should we be doing something else right now that we're not doing? Um, I do think that our ability to engage the, um, the recommendations that are being put out, even if they're not, uh, even if they're not, um, uh, enforced, uh, is far better far greater than what we saw in Italy when those recommendations were being made. That being said, um, there are also some real challenges. Number one, we don't have universal health coverage, which means that there are a group of people who are, uh, who are left out of our healthcare system uh, in whom this, this virus may spread. Number two, um, I'm really concerned about the fact that like, people don't seem to be taking this as seriously as they may need to be, given that you know, you're seeing you know, lines outside of bars uh, to go hang out, right? This is not right. uh, a snow day scenario. This is um, this is a social distancing scenario. And then number three, um, I I still worry that we don't have the means of being able to identify uh, who is infected and who's not, um, which eliminates um, our capacity to uh, contact trace at scale. And contact tracing is the sort of the the, the basic workhorse of public health. You identify people who are exposed. Uh, you either isolate them or quarantine them. Uh, and then you find their contact and keep going. 
Um, and without being able to rule out people who aren't in fact infected, uh, there's some real risk of being able to overwhelm or of, of that system over being overwhelmed. Um, because the system can't, it can't handle everybody just showing up at the ER today, go to the ER and get, uh, no. and ask for a test. Is, that's right. Not, that's not, that can't happen. That's right. And so actually just, uh, we, we, I wrote an op-ed with a, um, a colleague of mine that, uh, that'll come out, uh, soon calling for, uh, a, almost a COVID care system, right? So we have our healthcare system. COVID-19 it's already, is the virus, right? Exactly. COVID-19 is the name of the, the syndrome, uh, that's caused by the virus. And, um, and the idea being that, you know, what they did in China was understand that they needed an alternative healthcare system to be able to deal with COVID-19 uh, in and of itself. And that, you know, our healthcare system is already strapped as it is, right? The average wait time is still uh, in the 20 some days uh, to get an appointment. And we know that it doesn't enfranchise people uh, who don't have money. And we know uh, that, um, that uh, given the way it works, there's a lot of holes between uh, insurance and, and, and the healthcare system itself, like what we really need to be able to do is set up a temporary uh, emergency set of facilities in major metropolitan areas all over the country um, to be able to provide uh, care for people who are um, triaged into that system. If they have, uh, a, a, um, if they have a fever uh, and they're tested uh, positive for coronavirus or they're tested negative for the flu or the pneumonia, which are the two most likely things to cause a fever if it's not coronavirus, then they're shunted into that system, cared for in that system, um, so do, we don't overwhelm the healthcare system as it is and see a full collapse. How the hell are we going to set up something like that this quickly? Well, um, if we were going to do it, it would require us to be able to call up uh, the National Guard um, and even to support the National Guard with with military personnel. Um, you know, they have the logistics capacity to uh, to be able to set up these kinds of uh, these kinds of facilities quickly in uh, challenging circumstances. They have the authority. Uh, to be able to, you know, facilitate transit ways into them. Um, and, uh, you know, they can be trained up pretty quickly uh, by calling up medical personnel who are either in retirement or uh, even advancing folks like residents uh, or, 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 or uh, nurses or nurse practitioners who are retired um, to be able to oversee uh, groups of, uh, of, of, of guardsmen who, um, uh, who can do some of the basic things uh, that are required to care for folks with with COVID nineteen. The nice thing about this disease, if there is, there are two nice things about it. If there are anything nice about it at all, number one is it doesn't affect children um, uh, right. as strongly as it affects adults, and number two, uh, it, um, it 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 has a very stereotyped course. Um, right, people who are suffering from it are going to have very similar symptoms, and so you know you don't need to train these personnel up to be able to care for everything. Um, you just need to train them up to be able to care for somebody with this disease and know when to notify medical personnel if and when something happens. Um, I just worry, right? Like the numbers that we're seeing in terms of uh, the possible number who are, are severely ill um, or need ventilator care are just going to vastly overwhelm what our healthcare system can do on its best day. We don't have enough of beds. We don't have enough ICU beds uh, to handle what they say is coming. We don't have enough ventilators. Um, I, I heard that there's just 60 to 70,000 ventilators in the whole country. And we may need double, triple, quadruple that. That's right. And that's right. And that's, that's the, that's the scariest thing. And so when people want to understand like why we're doing all this social distancing, it's because we want to slow down the epidemic curve um, and make sure that the number of people who need care all at once doesn't overwhelm our ability to provide it. And so that's why slowing it down is so important. It seems like the elephant in the room here, though, is, as you say, okay, so we're the United States of America. We do have this great infrastructure. We have, we have all the technology and the machines and the this and that. Not, a, not enough for something that as bad as this could get. But, um, um, you know, we, we're, the, we're the USA. <laughs> so so mm-hmm. it, we, but the elephant in the room is that it's not a healthcare system for all. It's not, right. it's not something, and it would seem like a lot of people are going to, first of all, perhaps not go and get help or get tested because um, they know the bill they're going to get if they go to the ER, if they, if they um, uh, uh, Representative Katie Porter did this thing, and I saw on a committee there the other day where she laid it out on a whiteboard that uh, the tests that you'll have to go through at the ER normally they'd charge you $1,100, $1,200 for what people don't have $1,200. They're not going to go and get tested. 
And so things will just get worse because we don't have a system where that test would just be free. If you were in Canada, if you were in, in the UK, if you were in France, if you just pick another country, just pick any, any democracy, Belgium. Um, that's my favorite go-to by the way, Belgium, like if Belgium can do it, why can't we do it? But Mm -hmm. why, you know, it would seem like that this is, you know, and again, people will say, listening to this, well, you just don't turn this into a political thing. But uh, but to me, everything is, you know, political. I'm like, uh, you know, the air I'm breathing today, the air quality I'm breathing today is political. Um, so, um, that we don't have this, that people, um, are afraid of the copays or the deductible, um, or, or, you know, they just, they just aren't going to seek the help. Or I just love it when these, at that press, every press conference, they all stand at the mic there with Trump and they tell people that if you're feeling sick, don't go to work. Oh, oh really? Yeah. Uh, it's easy, easy to say. Yeah. Because we don't have a paid sick leave, uh, uh, law in this country where in all these other countries if you're sick you stay home and you don't have to worry about getting paid you get paid Mm -hmm. we've got half the country living from paycheck to paycheck Mm -hmm. uh 40 percent of the country doesn't have four five hundred dollars to their name Mm -hmm. i mean actual cash available if there's an emergency that's right how are we i mean uh can I call you Abdul? Me, <laughs> yeah, just, of course. Dr. Dr. Sayed. I mean, Abdul. seriously, yeah, if it would just seem, and I, and I know we can't really engage in this debate too deeply right now, but it would seem that there's an easy solution for that. When we have a crisis like this, we don't have to worry. Nobody has to worry about getting help. That's right. Well, I'll tell you this, you know, one of the things I love about your work is that you've documented the fact that America is not America for everybody. And there are so many people who are left out, marginalized, oppressed out of uh, the systems that uh, we rely on in this country to offer folks a dignified life, whether that be um, health care, which I'll, I'll talk about more in a second, but also housing or basic employment or uh, retirement or a living wage. Uh, or access to the vote or uh, access to the stock market, like all of these things that we point to, um, a whole swath of Americans are not included in them. I wrote a, a book uh, that comes out in a couple of weeks called Healing Politics, um, which really documents this idea of an epidemic of insecurity where people being left out are left insecure from the things uh, that they would have, should have, could have relied upon uh, to keep themselves whole, to allow themselves to live a dignified life. When it comes to healthcare in particular, though, I think it's the tip of the iceberg because, um, you know, the idea that people are left out of a system uh, that you need for something as basic as keeping yourself alive if something bad happens um, really typifies exactly what it means to put basic goods and services behind a paywall. And that's what we've done in this country. And we do it all the time so that CEOs like the folks who lined up with uh, Donald Trump at his press conference um, can make a bit of money off of uh, basic goods and services that other countries in the world have realized just ought to be there for you because you're a human who lives in our country, right? And um, the consequence when it comes to preventing a disease like this is huge. And it's not just the, it's not just the uninsured, right? It's also the fact that um, even if you have insurance in this country, the average deductible is $5,000 and $5,000 you have to pay in the beginning of the year. So the fact that this COVID-19 epidemic pandemic is happening in uh, the first couple of months of the year means that a lot of people are going to avoid getting health care because they're worried about getting hit by, with the deductible, which is just a cost that you pay to get access to the thing you already paid for, right? right it's a, right. an absurd system. And this is why, you know, I, I, I like, I, I appreciate your point about, about this not being a political situation, but like you said, um, everything is political. We, we make political choices about whether or not we want leaders who dignify uh, basic human rights. We make decisions about whether or not we want leaders who um, center science in conversations about healthcare. We make decisions about whether or not we want leaders who have experience taking on um, big societal problems and investing uh, in government's ability to do that. Like those are political decisions that have deep impact on our public health, and they're not outside of the bounds of our conversation um, when we're talking about how uh, our public health has been mismanaged politically. We have to talk about that, and if we don't, right, then we're failing to hold accountable the very people. Um, whom we've given right. uh, the, 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 the ability to lead. Okay. So, but you live in Detroit. So that means 
you're essentially, um, you know, at the narrowest point there of the Detroit River. You're a quarter mile from a country where we wouldn't even be having this discussion about copays and deductibles and whether people are going to be worried about being able to afford it. And I mean, this isn't, you know, this is for those of us you know, from Michigan, we literally, you know, Sarah Palin used to say, I can see Russia from my front porch. We literally can see Canada. It's, it literally is right there. And it's, it's gotta be a bit maddening. Um, I know it is to people, especially in Michigan. I know people who actually go over to Canada mm -hmm. and they purchase their, you know, prescriptions there. They, I know people that, uh, have fake Canadian ID, uh, in order to get the Ontario healthcare card, uh, that allows them to go to the doctor for free. If they need to go to the hospital for free. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm just curious, <laughs> have you had these same thoughts as I've had as a, as a Michigan, uh, person here, just thinking, God, it's right there. How can they do it? And we can't do it. You know, absolutely. You know, I, I'll tell you, as an epidemiologist, I think about those statistics, right? Because I was the health commissioner for Detroit, um, a city that in its bankruptcy made a decision to shut down its health department, a 185-year-old institution. They shut it down. Um, wow. That in a city with a higher infant mortality rate than my father's native country of Egypt, uh, threefold the probability of being hospitalized for asthma, fourfold the probability of being exposed to lead. I could look across the river every day from where I worked at the health department and see a, uh, a place in Windsor where folks had universal access to healthcare. It didn't matter who they were, where they were born, um, or, uh, or what their parents did for work or how much money they made. Um, they live two years longer on average than we do in the United States, and they're universally happier with their healthcare. And that's because their government um, has stepped up and uh, they as a society made a decision to provide uh, every single person in Canada access to health insurance um, as as a matter of, 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 of a public government good. Um, and that's the debate we're still having in this country right now. That's the policy that so many people point to and say, well, wouldn't that be so extreme? Wouldn't that be so radical, right? That Wouldn't that take away your health insurance? Um, and I just wish I could swim across the river and point and talk to any single person on the street and ask them, well, tell yeah. me, are you worried that you might not get health care if you get sick? Um, and, nobody. And, and, and look, at exactly. Nobody, nobody over there is worried about it ever. And as soon as they get sick or feel like they're getting sick, they go to the doctor and they nip, they nip what they have in the bud, whether, whether it is a cold or the flu or, or whether it's that little lump that people put off going to see the doctor about because, ah, you know, it's just, I've, I've had that little lump there for a long time, you know, and you put it off and you put it off and suddenly you're told it's stage four. And um, you probably don't have long to live. Uh, the number of people I think that die in this country as a result of not having that immediate and free um, health care that you have in Canada or any of these other uh, democracies in the world. It, I mean, what would that look like? I mean, tell people because, I mean, you've been following the debates and, you know, and, and it must be hard listening to Democrats. The more moderate uh, Democrats argue against um, a system like Canada's, you know, people don't want to give up their, their beloved private health insurance and all that. Um, and I, frankly, I, I never hear anybody talk about their love of their insurance company. Uh, mm -hmm. they're constantly fighting with their insurance company to pay the friggin' bill, you know, <laughs> whether they, whether the patient is fighting the insurance company or the doctor's office is fighting the insurance company to get payment. Um, I don't know who loves their insurance company. They love their doctor. Um, they love the nurses and the people that help them in the hospital. Uh, but, you know, I, mean, I, I haven't talked to you during this election season, but I'm just curious, you know, when you're listening to this and you're listening to these descriptions and these comments of the debate, what, what, what has gone through your head? How, how many times have you wanted to leap out of your uh, chair and in, into the television screen mm. and say, hang on, I have something to say about this. Yeah, it's it's um it's a deeply frustrating state of play right now uh, for a couple of reasons. A, if you talk at all to the people who are on the wrong side of the health system, which by the way is most people, it includes 
not just the patients who can't get their health care, the 42% of patients who are diagnosed with cancer who have to exhaust their life savings to get cured. Uh, but it also means the doctors and the nurses and the staff at hospitals, they know that they're getting nickel and dimed. And why? Because you have CEOs, whether they be uh, for health insurance companies or hospitals or pharmaceutical companies who are making tens of millions of dollars a year uh, off of this system. And um, what I wish people could understand, right, is that um, right now our system uh, exists to exclude people from getting the health care that they already paid for. Like that's the way insurance makes money, right? You pay an insurer a premium every month and then their job is to hold on to as much of that premium as possible or force you to pay a little bit more if in fact you do get sick and need to pay, uh, they need to pay out um, for, the, for the treatment for your sickness. Um, meanwhile, they're all negotiating sweetheart rates between each other, the hospitals and the insurance companies um, that ultimately end up raising the cost of care on everybody. And who wins in that? It's those CEOs, the C-suite executives uh, who are telling us that somehow somebody wants to take our health care or spending a ton of money to influence our election um, to force politicians to carry their message too. And so, you know, when I hear people talk about Medicare for all who want it uh, or um, uh, a public option, like what I'm hearing are folks who, who fear uh, what the health insurance industry and the healthcare industry will do or say uh, if um, they are willing to, to follow the courage of their convictions uh, and actually stand up for Medicare for all. And, um, and it's frustrating to see because the people who suffer are all the rest of us. And shouldn't our politics be a refuge for us uh, in a democratic society to be able to claim uh, what should be rightfully ours in the richest, most powerful country in the world, which is basic access to health care um, that doesn't go away if you lose your job, that doesn't uh, uh, increase in costs every year, that doesn't force you to hit a deductible paywall uh, if you get sick at the beginning of the year. Um, and, and, and yet, and yet, right. And the, the fact that, uh, and the, right. The opponents of this say, well, we can't afford it. We, like, we can't afford it. And I say, well, Canada can afford it. Belgium can, can afford it. Mm -hmm. The Netherlands can afford it. Um, there are either, there are also countries that are not in the first world. Um, if you've gone anywhere around this globe, um, even some of the, the poorest countries have a universal health care. They're people, they don't, they don't have the facilities that we have. They're poor. Um, but they have a, an, an ethos that says anybody who gets sick must be helped. Not, and it should have nothing to do with how much is, is in their pocketbook or in their wallet. Um, and just, can you just walk, um, people through what, um, what, what they're calling a Medicare for all program, but, it, but a Canadian style system what sure. that would look like? What would that look like to the average person listening to this? And then, and then maybe address the the bugaboo of of what you know they're told by Democrats that this is not realistic. This is going to cost too much money, um, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So what what this is is called single payer, and let me explain what that means. As a patient, right? As somebody in the system who's a consumer of healthcare, um, you buy insurance or if you're if you're privileged enough your employer buys insurance on your behalf that insurance doesn't actually provide you any health care what it does is it pays for health care if you need it and the people who actually provide you health care are the doctors and the nurses and the hospitals that you go to to get the health care that you need when you need it and so you end up having this system where you're caught between the payers the insurance companies because they pay for your care and the providers and right now we have what's called a multi-payer system. You got a bunch of different insurance companies, right? Right around seven thousand total, and their whole uh, their whole goal is uh, to be able to, like we talked about earlier, take the premiums that you and your employer pay in and keep as much of them as possible to make a dollar. And then out of that cost, they have to pay for marketing, they have to pay their CEO, they have to pay uh, all of these extraneous things that that really shouldn't exist in the system. And then on top of all that, there's a huge army of billers so that these payers and these providers can talk to each other and uh, facilitate a transaction. And one thing that I always like to point out to people is, you know, when you get sick and you get health care, you think of yourself as the customer, but you're not actually the customer. You're a reason why the payer paid the providers. So really, you're the reason for a financial transaction, which makes you more the product. What single payer healthcare does 
is that it eliminates all of those extra payers and creates one single payer, one insurance, which is the government. And the reason that that's so powerful is uh, a, a couple of things. Number one, you don't have to worry about who's paying into the payer because you're a resident of the United States of America, right? You get access to that care. And so that's coverage for everybody all the time, anywhere, anytime, doesn't matter the circumstance. Number two, um, because there's one payer, uh, it creates what's called a monopsony. Now, everybody knows what a monopoly is. A monopoly is a single uh, seller of a good. And if you have a monopoly, if they're the single seller, they can manipulate the price. A monopsony is the demand version. There's a single buyer of the good, uh, which means that they also can manipulate the price, meaning that the government can can negotiate down the cost of healthcare for all of us. And then three, that army of billers that you have to have in the multi-payer system that we live in right now, that goes away because everybody knows how to how to bill that one single payer uh, which is Medicare for all. And so this system is so much more effective, so much more efficient, and so much more equitable than the system that we uh, have right now. The big difference is that you don't have millionaire CEOs uh, scooping up a huge amount of money uh, out of off the top of the system. Um, and I'm okay with that. So why are we told that, that we can't have this? Why are we told that we can't afford this? Um, if everybody else can... I don't, I, this is just so baffling, I think, to a lot of people. Yeah, we're told that we can't have this for a couple of reasons. Number one, because the, the really, really rich folks who make a lot of money off the system don't want us to have it. And so um, uh, there's a famous ad called the Harry and Louise ad. Michael, do you remember the Harry and Louise ad? I do remember this, yes. So back when the Clintons tried to reform healthcare, and it wasn't at all as sweeping as Medicare for all. Um, the insurance industry thought that it might hurt their bottom line. And so they, they ran this ad called Harry and Louise. And it was this sort of fictitious couple uh, who could have been your next door neighbors in some suburban community somewhere in America. And um, they say that the famous line is when, when, when they choose, we lose. Here's the thing. The health insurance industry has been scaring us that uh, A, um, the, that Medicare for all would take away our quote unquote choice. Uh, even though actually the health insurance industry actually takes away our choice because they limit what doctors we can see and what doctors we can't by putting them in network or out of network. Um, whereas under Medicare for all, everybody's in network because everybody has the same insurance. Uh, two, they tell us that it's too expensive because they point to these huge numbers and say, well, it would cost $20 trillion or $50 trillion or whatever, how many trillion dollars they want to point to. But what they don't realize is that our healthcare system right now costs that much. Um, the difference is how it's paid for and who pays. Uh, so instead of, um, instead of reducing the overall cost, like I talked about with Medicare for all, um, and having it come out of the taxes that, uh, that corporations would pay in, uh, or even that, that folks like you and me might pay in, um, instead what we're paying is these premiums, these deductibles and these copays that hit us all at the worst times, like when we need care rather than, uh, just having the care there for us. Uh, when we need it. And they, they use our fear of really big numbers uh, to tell us that it's, it's too expensive, uh, even though actually it would be far cheaper over the long term. Um, and the cost wouldn't come at the moments that we, uh, we don't have money, but instead be, the healthcare would be there for us as we needed it. And so what do you say, though, to that union member, though, that does have, you know, decent health insurance, decent coverage, I should say, um, still significant co-pays and deductibles? I mean, what do you say to that that person that they claim is not going to want to give up, you know, from their cold dead hands their their beloved health insurance? I would say, uh, look, I I stood with you, uh, dear UAW member, in July of of 2019 when um, when GM uh, took away your health insurance that you had negotiated because uh, you had the audacity to strike against them. So, what does it mean to negotiate for health insurance when uh, the corporation you work for can take it from you the minute you decide to go on strike. Imagine if we had Medicare for all and you wouldn't have to worry about whether or not they could take your health care from you. And instead of instead of negotiating for something as baseline as health care, you could be negotiating for better benefits, for paid sick leave, uh, for uh, a better retirement package. Um, and I would say, uh, imagine you wanted to go and start a small business or imagine you wanted to go and write that you know, blockbuster novel that you, you've been thinking about your whole life. Um, what if you didn't have to stay in your job because that was the only way that you could have health care and you and your family uh, could be secure? What if you knew that it was going to be there for you even as you went and you did the thing that really truly spoke to who you wanted to be in the world? 
Um, my God, you'd have freedom, first getting. of all. How many people stay in yeah. their job because, well, the benefits, I can't lose the benefits. What, what, what if the benefits were guaranteed to you by, by your government and paid for by your taxes? Um, and you could just do what you wanted. If you were tired of working in that job, if you wanted to try something else, you could do it. That's what they do in these other countries. They quit. They quit and they move on. They try something else and they don't have to worry about it. It, it seems like um, just that offer of that freedom, because I think we all, everybody has this sort of chokehold around them that, oh my God, if I didn't, if I didn't have my benefits, my health insurance, mm-hmm. you should be basing your decisions on how you want to live your life. And how many spouses stay in relationships, stay in marriages, um, because they're so afraid that if, if they, if they left the old man, um, they, they'd be off the, they'd be off the health insurance. How many, yeah, how many that, that, people just are not happy because they can't be who they want to be, can't live the life they want to live. Um, and so, um, are prisoners to their, to the life they're living because they can't take the risk of not being covered in case they or their children get sick. Yeah, that's, that is the fear right now for so many people is that if something bad happened to me, how would I get my health care? Or put the other way, if I truly deeply wanted to live the life I wanted to live, how would I pay for health care? And you think about, you know, even if folks who focus so much on the economy as the, you know, the primary measure of whether or not we're doing well, um, how much more robust could our economy be if everybody was doing the thing that they found to be their highest calling? Rather than having to be stuck to the thing that that provided them healthcare, oh, boy, uh, and, when you put it like when you put it like that, wow, that's just got to be piercing to somebody listening to this that that wishes they were doing what they wanted to do, or would at least be able to take the time to do what they want to do, but not have to worry about just surviving. That's right, and and oh. unfortunately, right now, people are just that we're, we're working on the floor rather than reaching past the ceiling. So how much better um, off would the society be? I wonder, I have, I've often wondered this, if people actually went and tried or worked the job they wanted to work or do the thing they wanted to do, how much better we off we might all be because that person is going to, I mean, fill in the blank, come up with the next cure for something or or come up with an invention or an idea. Um, yep. the, the, the things that we're used to now that we have, our computers and the whole digital era that we live in, are, these all came out of somebody's garage. Yeah, you know, and, that's right. And and what if you didn't have to worry about the basics? Even in in many of these other uh, you know European countries, if you don't want to, if you want to leave your job, there's a cushion, there's a, a a grace period you have where the you will get unemployment insurance even if you quit, not because you were laid off, but because you decided you wanted to try something else, and you and you have a grace period, you have. You don't have to worry about paying the rent, the mortgage, food on the table, all these things that we can't even imagine living like that. And yet so many tens, hundreds of millions of people around uh, this globe, not just in Europe, Japan, Australia, um, lots of, lots of countries (laughs) don't have to worry about this. And, you know, Abdul, I just, you know, I look to people like you and, 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 you know, you ran for office. This was part of your platform for governor of Michigan. Um, it, you know, Bernie has run on, on this, uh, this year. It, it's, and it's so funny, all the exit polls in every single primary, the majority in every state, including states like Mississippi and Alabama have said they prefer a Medicare for all program, even in, and even in some of these states last week in the primary, just to try, sort of prime the pump against Medicare for all. They asked the question this way, um, would you be in favor of giving up your private uh, health insurance and having it replaced by a government program? Mm-hmm. And guess how many in and Michigan they still, said they yes. still said yes. Yeah, well, yeah, how, what was it in Michigan? 57% in Michigan. 57? 57. 57% said, yeah, actually, I would, I would give up my health insurance to have a government program. Yeah. I mean, when are we going to, when are we going to wake up here? 
and that's the thing I, I, I always tell folks. I'm like, look, the the future is with us on on this. And I think, you know, in particular, my generation who um, graduated into the worst recession uh, in, 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 in modern history, um, who has been strapped with $1.5 trillion in debt simply to get an education, uh, who is watching mm. the clock count down on the, on the globe itself, um, who realizes that uh, they're getting nickeled and dimed by a bunch of millionaires um, to have their health care behind a paywall. Like our generation realizes that this is the future. It's only a matter of time. And so I always tell folks, I'm like, look, it's not about any one election or the next election. It's about the steady uh, drumbeat of progress in the direction uh, of empowering people in, in our country to live the lives that, um, that, that we know we all deserve simply because, uh, because we're human and because um, human flourishing requires it. And so I, I just, I, I think time is, time is, uh, is ticking, but, but, but history is on our side. Yeah. I'd like to, so you're optimistic. I mean, you, I hear this in your voice. You, you, you think it's just really a matter of time. And as older people leave us, uh, a younger generation understands us. I mean, all the polls show that, that millennials, the Gen Z kids, um, everybody, Everybody younger already gets this, and you know it, it's. I, I don't. I don't have the uh, privilege not to be optimistic, right? And I see these young folks working and agitating every day, um, and I also know that uh, that um, there's something extremely hopeful about how far we've come. You know, you look at uh, what Bernie has been able to do over the last five years in terms of moving our public conversations. It's frankly unprecedented. Um, we've never seen anything like it. Uh, in terms of moving a set of issues onto the national paradigm um, that are fundamentally reshaping and, and 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 forcing us to rethink how we live our lives and why, um, and so you know I, I I'm a I'm a younger man, but um, but I also appreciate that the sweep of history is very long, and sometimes you work and you work and you work for something, and then all of a sudden it happens, and so um, you know our job is to continue to push for that work to center the people who are. Uh, on the wrong end of some of these bruising, punishing systems of insecurity, um, and to empower them uh, by being able to believe in human dignity and what can happen when we all uh, choose to invest in it. Mm. What, what would you say to people listening to this right now? What can they do in their daily lives, individually or collectively, with their friends, their neighbors, if they belong to a group or whatever? What can they do to help move us closer to that day when nobody has to worry about going to the doctor? Nobody ever has to worry about if they come down with an illness, if they contract the coronavirus or whatever, that that's, that's okay. The system is here to help you, and we're going to build a system that's going to be able to have the things that we need to help you. Yeah, I'll say, I'll say four things. The first is, given that we're in the context of a coronavirus uh, pandemic, I would say listen to um, your local and state public officials. Uh, make sure to keep you and your loved ones safe. The second thing I would say, though, um, is have a conversation with the people uh, you know disagree with you. And don't focus so much on winning the argument. Focus on winning the future. And when they realize that you're speaking to them from a place of concern because you care about them as human beings rather than caring about proving yourself right or proving themselves wrong, then uh, people are a lot more receptive to the message. The third, mm -hmm. I'd say... Um, is, uh, you know, leverage your story. Everybody has a story of uh, how this, this absurd system has mistreated them um, and the, the hazards it's created in their lives. Um, and I would share that story. I'd share it widely. I'd think about how to tell it well because uh, your story is the most powerful thing. And then four, you know, find the young people in your life, whoever they are. And for me, right, it's my two-year-old little daughter um, and believe in them. And, um, and if you believe in them and you empower them and you work for them, You'll uh, you'll find that you uh, can do, and you're empowered to do things that you didn't think were possible. Mm, wow, those are those are great words to hear, and and doable. Everyone who just heard that can do those things. Mm -hmm. um, and starting with for today, take care of yourself because you're no good to everybody else if you if you get sick. It seems like just swinging back to the coronavirus thing here for a second that that um, you know, you and I are talking about trying to create a, a system that covers everybody and we all, you know, it's all for one and one for all. We're all in this together. We're all in the same boat. 
And yet what we're being told this week is uh, stay out of the boat that everybody else is in. Uh, you know, don't separate yourself from people at a time when we need to be with people more, more than ever. It's a weird dichotomy when you hear it, when you think about it, right? Um, that, and, and even just, you know, this as a doctor, even when, you know, when you're sick, when a patient is sick, the, psychologically, um, you don't want to be removed from people. You want, you want and need the love and, and support um, and intimacy from others. Uh, that, that is its own drug that we all need. How do you square that in this, in this moment that we're in right now? Well, I'd say, I'd say a couple of things. Number one, you know, all that we're doing right now, we're doing for each other, right? Um, you may not be the one who gets very sick from this uh, coronavirus, but it may be somebody that you love. And so you're keeping yourself healthy uh, and social distancing so that you can protect them, right? And so it really is a collective act. The second is that, you know, well, I'm grateful for technology that, you know, you and I can talk from, you know, from Michigan and New York and uh, and we can talk to folks face to face in ways that we never could in the past. Um, take advantage of that um, and call folks and tell them you love them and tell them that you care about them and that you're thinking about them and that you hope that they stay safe. Um, and then lastly, um, you know, for the folks that you are with, right? Um, I don't often get to spend as much time with with my wife and daughter as uh, as I'm spending right now, and so I'm going to take advantage of it. And I think that's a really uh, clear benefit too. And so um, you know, doing the things that uh, you can to uh, remember why you're doing this who you're doing this for um, and who you're doing this with, I think can be really powerful. Yeah, that's, I think that's very, I think I've heard, I mean, I was talking to a couple of friends yesterday. We were saying, well, now that we're in this uh, sort of uh, new world order of how we're living our daily lives, a lot of people aren't going to work. They're working from home. Um, the kids are home now in many, many States. Um, uh, maybe by the time, um, we finish this conversation the um it'll be most states where school is out school is out for a month school is out for the rest of the year um mm -hmm. so in a way in a way where maybe in the old days the way we were raised where you know there were parents that were home um when we got home from school uh now now everybody's home <laughs> with the kids all day long and i've heard you know numerous comments and jokes about that um because it really isn't something that we're used to, but, but it also is a moment where we can take advantage of this, that, mm -hmm. that we can come closer together, that we can do things that we maybe normally don't have a chance to do because we're in the rat race. Um, and maybe, and maybe somebody who's listening to this will decide, you know, now that things have, we're in sort of a, we're all in our sort of quiet room right now. You know, I've always wanted to, to do X, whatever the X is, you know, I always wanted to learn how to, um, you know, to paint, <laughs> to write a poem, to, you know, I think I'm good at music. I have no idea how to write music, but maybe I'm, I'm just going to turn on the microphone and just <laughs> start singing. I, I, I mean, you could go down a whole list of things or how about all those books that you've been wanting to read all these years? Um, the great novels you never, for some reason you missed them when you were in school. Now's the time you can read them. I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to find a silver lining in all this, but um, I think we can come out of this better, better people, stronger, um, uh, better citizens in a democracy demanding that, that we have systems that support each other. That, I mean, you and mm -hmm. I are talking now while the 60 or 70,000 ventilators are still kind of sitting there and able to be used today, tomorrow, whatever, we could be mm -hmm. a week or two away from doctors, doctors in, in hospital hallways where they've got gurneys lining the hallways and having to decide who lives and who dies because mm -hmm. they only, not everybody can use the same ventilator. I mean, we're this, this is a possibility, right? So what's happening in Italy right now. That's, that's the fear, right? Is that that's what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to avoid that circumstance. And that's why we're doing this. Um, but I do think it's, you know, this is an opportunity, I think, to, to reflect and to use your time in the ways that, um, that you can. One of the challenges with the society as it stands right now is that everybody's moving so fast that sometimes we're so focused on the what that we forget the why. And 
uh, maybe this is an opportunity for all of us to remember our why and to invest in that a little bit. And, um, mm. you know, it's, it's something that, uh, that I think we all ought to, ought to be thinking about. Um, and if anyone needs in a little extra reading, I, uh, you know, got a book coming out in a couple of weeks. I hope you'll check it out. Yeah. Tell people about this book. It's called healing politics, a doctor's journey into the heart of our political epidemic. And, um, you know, in, in a lot of ways, actually, it's particularly relevant now because what I do is I use, uh, the science of epidemiology, which um, which is is what I trained in, and uh, my own life story to then break down where we sit right now in terms of an epidemic that I diagnosed called the epidemic of insecurity. All of the ways in which uh, the basic means of a dignified life have been stripped away from people in their uh, in their lives, whether it's healthcare or housing uh, or or access to an economy that pays a living wage uh, or access to our democracy. Um, or access to our politics, like all of these things uh, that are just being stripped away from people. And then the impact that it has in terms of how insecurity teaches us to like guard what we have rather than to invest in what we could have. Um, and, and, and that's a medical issue. Exactly. It's, it's framing the situation we're in right now. Like think about all the people who are suffering this. It's not just the people who are going to get the disease uh, and, and potentially die. It's all of society that is so uh, situated within the crevices of uh, of our social infrastructure that, um, that they could fall through. And, uh, we've built a society that's so porous that way, um, because of this system of insecurity. Um, and so understanding how coronavirus is going to impact us isn't just about the disease. It's about the context of the disease. Um, and then, you know, I, I go, we'll go forward and talk a little bit about how our politics needs to embrace an understanding of insecurity and the fear that it causes when, uh, when we articulate what it is that we want for our future, right? You can't just yell yeah. at people and tell them they're wrong. You have to empathize with them to understand why they're scared and, um, and, and what it can be done if we're willing to have that kind of empathy for people, even with whom mm. we, don't, we don't agree. And I think those in power know that the more insecure we feel, the more fear we have, the more anxiety, the more pressure on us, the more demoralized we are, the more debilitating it all feels the despair, all of that, these are weapons against us that keep them in power. They keep right. the status quo, the status quo. That's right. Um, Nobody has weaponized insecurity like Donald Trump has. Yeah. Um, oh boy. And that's, that's exactly what he's done. He's politically weaponized insecurity against us. And if we want to be able to defeat him, then we have to find the antidote. And the antidote isn't yelling louder. Um, the antidote is understanding and asking why people are in pain. Um, and how we can communicate, right? Truth to pain. We often talk about truth to power, and I don't think anybody on the left has trouble with that. I, what I do think is that we have trouble speaking truth to pain, and um, mm. and that's because sometimes we can't find our empathy to appreciate why people are in pain and what pain does um, to people uh, mm. when they're making hard decisions. Wow. Just before we go here, tell me, um, what what are you doing uh, to keep you and your family safe right now? What are you? How are you? What have you changed? How are you living today, tomorrow? What are you planning? Uh, what is your plan B if things uh, get worse? Uh, I'm just curious as a, as a, as a doctor, um, you know, what can we learn from what you're doing? Well, I'm trying to be very, very thoughtful about, um, you know, about risk and reward. And so I know that, you know, in, in my life, given uh, my work in public health, um, that being able to communicate about, about this uh, matters a lot and can really help people. And so the only times I'd put myself in, in harm's way um, would be if there's a public health responsibility on the back end of it. But otherwise, um, you know, my my uh, daughter is staying home from preschool now, uh, from uh, daycare now. Um, and uh, my wife, who's a psychiatrist, is is trying to move uh, most of her uh, her work to uh, rather than face to face in person, which is ideal, of course, um, in the context of this epidemic, trying to do so by video. Um, and uh, and then we're we're really checking in on the people who are the most vulnerable in our, in our family, my parents and, and grandparents, and uh, trying to make sure that they're whole and they have what they need and they understand um, what the impact of this might be and, and how to keep themselves safe. Should we all be visiting our grandparents right now or not? I mean, if we don't know, because you know, there's so far nobody's getting tested that I know, um, what, what kind of risk are we, are we going to, are, are we going to be responsible for the deaths of our grandparents because we've had personal contact with them? Because we hug them always, and we kiss them and we... I always tell folks in, in this context, um, call, don't visit. 
and um, and make sure that they understand why you're calling and not visiting, right? Um, uh, you know, in, in certain circumstances, if if you need to be there to care for uh, for a senior relative, then that's a different story, and um, you just got to take extra care to make sure that you uh, are not exposing yourself and then exposing uh, your loved one. But um, but if you don't care for them actively every day, uh, the best approach is to is to call, don't visit, um, check in. You know, maybe that you need to do some grocery shopping or something for them, and that's fine. Uh, but then, you know, just leave them at the door, uh, give them a call and say, hey, I, I left them at the door uh, and, and they should be very diligent just to wipe stuff down um, as it comes into the house. But, uh, you know, over time, th- this is going to, as the case number of cases grow, the risk increases and, um, and we just got to start really thinking about making sure that we're keeping ourselves from being a, being a vector um, and, and, and protecting those who are most vulnerable to this. And what about your book? Are you going to go out on a book tour or have they so, canceled that? Or? So sadly, I had a 39-stop book tour um, oh, no. set up all over the country, and uh, we, uh, we've had to cancel it. We're, we're hoping to reschedule some of the events for August and September. But you know, at, at this point, it's just not uh, – it would be irresponsible as an epidemiologist who wrote a book about an epidemic uh, to, um, to, to create events where people uh, might spread an epidemic that's happening uh, amongst us. And so we canceled the whole thing. Um, and hoping wow. that, uh, that folks will, uh, will check out the book via, uh, you know, via other means. And, um, and, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard, but, you know, I, I honestly, I'm, I'm super privileged when it comes to this and like a lot of people have it so much worse. And so I'm just really grateful that, um, that, you know, my family and I are healthy and safe and, uh, and that, um, we're not in a situation where, you know, our, all of our means are potentially lost. And, and so I'm really well, just grateful. I'll remind people. Uh, to read your book and um, uh, because I think you have brought so much to the conversation. Those of us in Michigan um, who have known you and admired you, grateful to you for uh, speaking up uh, as, as a doctor. Um, uh, I'll just remind people the title of the book again. It's called healing politics, healing politics, a doctor's journey into the heart of our political epidemic our, our political epidemic what a what a great um title and um he says just as the sirens go by <laughs> <laughs> but no it's thank you for writing this and thank you for what you've done thank you for coming on rumble um here today and um um i want to believe we're going to be okay i don't you know Obviously, none of us can guarantee that, but um, I think this is a great time to be talking about these issues. Uh, obviously, taking care of ourselves and each other, but but also, um, let's not ever find ourselves in this situation again, where so many millions of our fellow citizens who are being told to stay home can't uh, stay home, have to work, or can't go to the doctor because of the sticker shock of that bill at the ER, all of this is just is so wrong and immoral to me. And, um, and next time around, there will be a next time we will have viruses and things. They, they are part of our natural system. Um, but next time around, um, I won't have to talk to you about this. Maybe. I, I hope not. And, um, and let's stay safe out there and, uh, let's remember this and, and make sure we're always fighting for a, a, a more just, equitable and sustainable world. Yes. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you for saying that. I've been talking to a uh, Dr. Abdul El Sayed, um, the former uh, health commissioner, the head of the Department of Public Health um, in uh, Detroit, Michigan, former candidate uh, for government uh, for governor of Michigan, and um, and I've I've seen you out there on the campaign trail for uh, the senator from Vermont. Uh, so thank you for all that you've done, and uh, thank you all of you who've been listening to this. And we'll probably be back again tomorrow. We're doing a series of these. Uh, each day or every other day um, uh, while we're in the middle of this uh, pandemic. Um, And I hope to uh, bring you further information and thinking that perhaps you're not getting uh, from the mainstream media. So that's what I'll, that's what I'll continue to do. This is Michael Moore. This is rumble. Thank you for listening. And, um, and and thank you, Dr. El Syed. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, Be well. You too. 